Nice to see everyone. May I call you Elaine? Oh, of course, please. Wonderful. Um, it's interesting about Elaine Chow because she is, I'm, I'm, I've been in Washington uh, way too long and, uh, and Elaine is very much a Washington institution, cabinet secretary married to the Senate majority leader and, and that's sort of how everybody. That means you're old. Yeah, <laughs> it's, that's, it's, everybody sort of sees you through that prism. But you, you've actually, before we get into some of the issues, you've got this fascinating immigrant story. Your father was born to um, subsistence farmers, yes. rural farmers in China, yeah. mm -hmm. um, was, was locked out of China, ended up in Taiwan, um, and ended up meeting and my, your, your my mother, mother. from a well-established family in Anhui province. And under ordinary times, two young people of such disparate socioeconomic backgrounds could never have met. And it was only during the turmoil of the times when China was consumed by civil war, foreign invasions, famines, natural disasters, that uh, two young people were able to meet. And, so, they, and he so in, 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 in crisis and in chaos, there is opportunity. It's an extraordinary story, and, and your mom became a historian and helped your yes. father build a shipping company that your baby sister runs, I believe now? Or yes, sister? so uh, I'm not involved at all in <laughs> the yeah. family business, but my father came to this country uh, first. It took him about three years before he was able to bring my two sister and me and my mother to America. And it is a tremendous statement about this country and the opportunities that it offers. So it was for interesting everyone. that you, um, but it was interesting that he didn't have the money to put you on a proper shipping you know, passenger ship, right? So you had to come over on a cargo ship. Um, we came on a cargo days, ship because and we you're couldn't eight years afford. Old? Yep, we couldn't afford, you know, an airplane ride, and uh, so. It took him about three years, we were separated. But the best part also was, if you want to know the whole story, uh, my father was a young man with very little, but he was tremendously talented, and his parents believed in education. So he grew up in a small farming village of 10 families, and it was only through scholarships that he was able to get the education and go to one of the best colleges uh, in China. And then a civil war occurred, it was in the turmoil of the times that he meets this beautiful young woman, and they, he says he fell in love right away. She said, eh, it's okay, you know, he's... Uh. But they took them separately to Taiwan, where they, he looked for her for two and a half years. When I say that to women, it's like, oh, can you imagine guys doing that these days? <laughs> and so they started a family, he was a sea captain. He was away many, many months out of the year. But he became one of the youngest sea captains at the age of 29. And when my mother was seven months pregnant with their third child, he had a dream, they had a dream, that they wanted to come to America. This is for a young couple who's never really lived abroad. Well, my mother never did. They never really even met white people. <laughs> Yet they had so much faith in America. And so he took examination, scored number one, and was able to come out, but he didn't have the money nor the papers for the rest of us. So my mother was seven months pregnant, and she told him, go to, you know, go to America, because they were so anxious. If you had a chance to go to America, the window can close very quickly. So within two weeks, he packed up and he left, and they did not see each other. We didn't see each other until three years later incredible. when he was finally able to bring us to Queens, New York. So we came to a one-bedroom apartment in Jamaica, New York, and uh, I went to PS 117, 217, then we moved to Syosset, and then began my, the, the obviously, began my, 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 van, my onward journey. And uh, here you America. are on your second tour of duty as a cabinet secretary, uh, and it's So I didn't even get my uh, citizenship until I was 19. Oh, is that right? Yeah. And I still remember how special that day was. It was almost like, you know, we had finally made it. Yeah. We were in the promised land, and everything was going to be okay. Can't tell you the joy of that moment. I am sure. So now you are... Um, Secretary of Transportation, um, having taken that ship across, and your father building a shipping company, and uh, the other transportation jobs. So, yeah, that so had. I, I come from a family of six daughters. Yeah. So I'm not involved in the business at all. I can't be, and, and I'm yeah. not. And also, the joke is, 
I'm not good enough to be actually in the business. Yes. So, they, you know. <laughs> but, so, but so you at are... least so my youngest sister, Angela Chow, who's daughter number six, and she's yes. about 21 years younger than I am. Same parents, and she's the one who's... She's CEO uh, of a shipping yeah, company. Yeah, she's chairman of the company. So let's talk I'm about... I'm very your... proud of her. She's a very nice, decent person. Yeah. I think that's the most important thing. So let's talk about your job now, because yeah. you are at... It, it is this extraordinary job at an extraordinary moment, which people don't focus on. Yeah. We talk about autonomous vehicles. We talk about drones. We talk about flying cars. We talk about all these technologies kind of in the realm of the private sector. But at the end of the day, Washington has a responsibility to regulate, to make sure these, these technologies are safe, to incorporate these technologies. Let's just start with um, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we all remember not very long ago, Tempe, Arizona, uh, the first fatality of a, of a driverless car in the United States. Uh, people are already, Americans are already like a little nervous about a AV. Um, and I remember reading at the time, somebody wrote that it showed that the safety protocol on this technology was had about as many holes as a Scottsdale golf course. <laughs> And you know, it, it, you've taken a pretty much of a more of a voluntary, or a, a, a some people would say lax no, mode to regulate no, it or no. How do you way. how do you view this? Your role at, at transportation. Let's talk about uh, autonomous vehicles. First of all, we are on the cusp of a transformation in transportation technology that will change the way we move, live, work, and connect with one another. We as regulators have a role to regulate that development. And our role in the transportation department is to address safety. So our department regulates all modes of transportation except for maritime. In safety, uh, we, have, we operate the national airspace that you travel in. So for us, we are an operating unit. We have 55,000 employees. Uh, the budget is $88 billion. A good day is when nothing bad happens. So what is your nothing approach? Nothing falls out of the skies. Okay, I'm going to get yeah, to but that. Yeah, you know, okay. so but okay. what okay. is your approach so to our regulating approach, AV? Number one, we want to safeguard uh, legitimate safety and legitimate public concerns about privacy and security without hampering innovation. Because innovation is a hallmark of who we are and it's part of our international competitiveness. So I have been, you know, I have um, besieged Silicon Valley and also the OEMs. This new technology is converging the traditional automakers and also Silicon Valley, all these high-tech companies. And they really need to work together because all the high-tech companies, they know technology. And they have such an interesting future that they envision for our world. The older uh, traditional auto manufacturers, they know safety. And they know what is required. So the two forces need to work together. And the tragic events at Tempe was a very stark example where if Silicon Valley and these high-tech companies do not make the rest of us more comfortable about technology, consumer acceptance will be the constraint to their growth. That's interesting. And when we have autonomous vehicles, we are not removing all risks. The risk is just moving from the human being to the software program. It's albeit a bit less, but there's risk in the software program. And, you and that's a, what happened in that particular accident. And you have a perspective tragic, tragic also accident. about regulating it needs to be technology neutral. What do you mean by right. that? So when you ask what kind of approach we take, we do not believe that the government is the best uh, purveyor of knowledge about high tech. Can you imagine? Uh, you do not want us to tell you what kind of car you want to drive, what kind of technology should go into that car. You want us to promote safety, to ensure that safety, security, and privacy are taken care of. But you don't really want us to tell you which type of technology should go into which car. So we believe in the private sector. We want to foster, maintain this wonderfully 
innovative culture, which is America. And we want to be not top down. We don't want to be command and control because the federal government, any government, is not nimble, flexible enough to deal with the rapid change in technology. And, and we want to so we want to be basically tech neutral, not command. Across the board. Control. Okay. And one example is when you have V you know, um, we have cars in the future that will speak with one another. So as one car comes next to another car, the car will say, hey, I'm in this lane. Get out of my way. Or you're 10 feet closer than you should be. So this kind of communication will go on. And there are competing software programs mm -hmm. on that. So we don't think that it's our job to say technology X is the best V2V technology that should currently be fostered, cultivated, encouraged by the federal government. Interesting. We believe that the private sector will have many, many options. And then uh, automakers, uh, high-tech companies will work together, you know, select by themselves which the ones they would like. Let's but, move to drones yes. since again we're moving and we, we have a short time. Um, you Very have pilot well. programs on yes. drones. W what are we going to see? Take us through the next year. Um, okay, did you know expect? that as of August 17th of this year, there are over 1.2 million drones registered? Wow. So part of our job in operating the national airspace is to ensure the safe integration of drones into our national airspace. So right now, drones can be operated by commercial interests, they can be operated by hobbyists, and they can go any place. Law enforcement is particularly concerned about drones and the military. They're not quite so sure that they like all these drones that can go anywhere. And so right now, any, oh, and by the way, we have 95,000 new drone operators. This is a new job category that didn't occur, you know, two years ago, five years ago. So right now, drones cannot fly at night. They cannot fly over the heads of people, and they can't fly out of the line of sight. But you see them do so, and that's because we are giving waivers. Okay. okay. So do you want us to give, like, as the volume increases, it would be beyond the ability of the government to give case-by-case -case waivers. So we have 10 pilot projects made up of consortiums of state, local, tribal governments, in some cases, to test drones in different conditions. They are testing them in Alaska, in North Dakota, in Arizona, in all different kinds of topography and climatic conditions. And so with that information, we will be able to better decide how best to re better, more regulate if that, uh, this burgeoning uh, new technology. So Elaine, we have one minute for you to tell us about flying cars. Uh, flying cars, someone who's very, very bright has already decided that it's not gonna go. So, I mean, you know, the, te the, the brilliance in this sector is unbelievable. I can't even understand what a flying car does and that one guy has already said, no, it won't work. Let me go back to the self-driving versus driverless cars. Americans, 74% of Americans do feel uncertainty when they hear the words driverless cars, self-driving cars. So once again, we have to make the uh, consuming public comfortable. And you know, self 94% of accidents occur because of human error. If there were self-driving cars, safety would increase. And we would also return mobility and freedom to the elderly and to the disabled. So there are benefits, but our role is to ensure that we regulate in the right way that will not hamper future innovation and creativity. And just to wrap it up here, you, you also like to say that it's the role of the innovators to make the case to the public. It's not your role. They should be making no, the case, neutral. and they haven't yet. We're, we're, yeah. we're tech neutral, you know, and we're not promoting any particular kind of uh, mode of travel. But I think... Consumer acceptance is going to be the constraint to growth. And all these wonderfully smart people, they must share with the rest of us their confidence, their assurance, and their love of this new technology. Elaine, because if they you. don't, we just won't grow as fast. Thank you so much. Thank you.